So this is probably 1979 or 80, and I'm um, and we're working. And we're cleaning the weeds out of the bunker. Was, we didn't have a lot of maintenance, you know, back then. And here comes a group of guys and they're playing. And General Greenfield, he hits it into the bunkers. And this guy was a great guy. And I knew him because I worked in the in the bag room and stuff. And he and his wife were just fantastic, wonderful people. And he was a general in the Air Force. And really was the a general. general. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he, he was a general. Yeah. And so he's he's in the middle of the scabs. And we're, we all stop working, you know, and so he can hit his shot. And, he, and he's down there with this wedge in his hand. And these guys that he's playing with are over there. And he, they can't see him. And he just yells out, they've got me surrounded. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Here we are. Thank you for joining us yeah. on the Golfer's Journal podcast. All the way from, where are you? And what are you doing? Oh. Hobart, Tasmania. So we're building a new course for Matt Goggin um, on the ocean here. It's about 10 minutes from Hobart International Airport, about 25 minutes from downtown Hobart. And it's on a peninsula of land that's that spreads east from where the airport is. And it's oceanfront dunes. Uh, Just a spectacular sight. Really, really cool. So not your first foray into Tasmanian design. Uh, we've done, we did a big piece in the golfer's journal about Cape Wickham. So you're, this is familiar, somewhat familiar territory for you, I guess. How long are you down there for? I uh, got here last December. So almost a year since Whoa. we came in, they finally opened up Australia's borders. And right. so my wife and I came to, came down when we could, we didn't know exactly how long the border was going to be open. We, we'd really been trying to get this, um, get this project going. It, it actually goes back um, quite a long ways. Matt Goggin, who grew up here in Hobart, played the PGA Tour for 15 years or so. Lives in Charlotte actually now. Uh, he's been there for a while since he, you know, since he was on the PGA Tour. But he comes back to Hobart quite regularly and knew about this property from growing up um, near there and playing Royal Hobart, which is just around the corner. And mm-hmm. but it's on like a flat piece of ground and. There was all this beachfront, and he and his mates would be, why? Why is it Royal Hobart here? <laughs> why? Why are we yeah. not on this piece of property? And so he's been sort of dreaming about this for a long time. And like Clayton, my my partner, and Clayton DeVries and Pont uh, has known Matt for basically since he was a junior golfer, and um, he's been involved. So Matt Matt um, found this a way to do this on the property because it's actually on public reserve land where he could get a long-term development authority. And, um, and Clates has been working with it. And in early 2020, Matt was coming over to relook at the site and all that. And, um, and so I came over also and we sort of got a fresh pair of eyes on it because I hadn't seen the site before. And uh, we finished, I flew home on March 14th, four days later, the world shut down. Yeah. Uh, and we sort of left and were like, yeah, you know, see in a few months when this thing blows over. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was almost two years. And um, so we, we came down a year ago and I went home for about a month, uh, June, July, and then um, came back. And I'll go home in a couple of weeks um, and then we'll I'll be back uh, end of January to finish up. Very, very exciting. So Lynx Land down, down there, is it, you know, it's in the dunes? Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. It was, it's adjacent to what was an old pine plantation and the pine trees, unfortunately, seeded themselves all over the dunes. So Mm -hmm. we, we were, it was forest. It was covered with radiata pines, which is basically a noxious weed over here. It's an invasive, um, you know, plant. Uh, And we had to, you know, those were harvested and taken off. And then we were left with a lot of rubbish piles from all the tops and garbage that's left over from a tree operation. And so just trying to, you know, do as best we can with removing the debris and then utilizing these really, really cool dunes. And it's so golf returning the landscape to what it's was originally probably looked like, uh, before 
yeah, they shouldn't be growing. Pine trees shouldn't be growing. In, in <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, um, just a fantastic site, though. Really, really amazing, and um, every day is really cool. And we've got seven holes seeded and growing grass in the range, and then we're working on awesome. the rest of the golf course. So yeah. private, public, can we come play it? Public, public golf. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Is yeah, there just a name? like just like Cape Wickham, Barn Boogle. Yeah. You know, super high level, um, super high quality, affordable golf um, for everybody. Matt's yeah, I mean, gonna have a you have a junior program. Uh, being a you know being a golfer that grew up in you know playing junior tournaments and things like that in Tassie and then you know on to the Australian stage and the world stage, um, he wants to you know have junior kids come there, have a place they can practice for nothing, you know, and develop games and things like that. So it's really cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Obviously a big boom in golf development in Australia, New Zealand in the last, I don't know, 10, 20, maybe going back further, how many years, uh, what do you attribute that to? I mean, you just mentioned you're building on, you said sort of public trust land, uh, and, and, and Lynx land is, is very precious. You know, if you look at Scotland and Ireland, you know, the British Isles, you're not going to get any more links land to build on there. You know, there's yeah. no more, no more, no more golf's going to be built on the dunes. It, it, you would think. Um, but is it a friendly environment down there towards golf? Yeah, it's a, it, they're, you know, Australians are, you know, they're great sportsmen. I mean, they love their cricket, which is going on right now. You know, the world cricket deals happening and I did um, not know that and golf. Um, so they're, um, they're, they're big sportsmen and really, really into it. And so I think it's a, um, a very positive, you know, environment for that and to try and do, do what's, you know, good to create opportunities and great sporting venues. And so, um, yeah, they have, uh, you know, it's a large country and with a much smaller population, the size of the, you know, U S basically, but only 25, 30 million people. So it's, it's really gotten incredible opportunities with regards to that. And this is a, yeah, it's a public reserve land. There were, over the years, there have been lots of proposals. Back in the 80s, there was a Japanese company that was going to level the entire like area where this is, plus some more, and, you know, create amusement parks and and, and housing and stuff. Unfortunately, that never happened because uh, it would have been gone. It's really a spectacular site. And, um, you know, we're just seeing bird life, you know, coming back onto the, onto the property because it was covered with, with trees. So the shorebirds right. and stuff, they had no, you know, they had no place to go to land. And now, and now there's just, we've got a, we've got a, you know, a bird that it goes by one of these trails. It's got a nest going right there right now. And every time we drive by, we feel bad because he leaves the nest and then comes right back. <laughs> He's so. scaring him up. <laughs> no, but that's, that's fantastic to hear because, you know, we've written about it in the golfer's journal and I, I, I've written about it and you hear about it so many places, how golf is helping, uh, helping, you know, ecosystems recover, uh, or, or, you know, whether, whether it's at sand Valley or, uh, or at Macaronish dunes or, or whatever, uh, you know, the golf is sort of, when you put golf there, one, it protects that property because it won't become homes. Uh, and then if you're deforesting property that should be deforested, then you're going to start to get, uh, some of those species back, um, fauna and, and, and animals that, uh, can't survive in like those pine tree canopies that somebody planted there, you know? So it's going to, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, when, when golf can help an, an area, not only, um, you know, protect an area from becoming something else, but also see it, see it come back to life. Absolutely. It's a, it's, um, it's a critical protector of ecosystems, really, when you think about it. You think about any big city, you fly over any big city, and what do you see as green space? You see golf courses, uh, you know, a park here and there, and a cemetery. And that's, you know, everything else is really hardscape. I mean, yeah, you certainly you have street trees and things like that, but a street tree lives, you know, about 15 or 20 years, and they replant another street tree. Um, it's just not a you know good environment for it. And that's, that's what I did my master's work on in Michigan was, was native plant ecosystems on golf courses and how you could integrate that into, into golf. So golf has this opportunity of, wow. of restoring, like in the case of what they're doing at Sand Valley, where 
beyond the golf, they have 7,000 acres that they want to restore to prairie and right. this very distinctive landscape that's basically vaporized uh, because there's, there's, there's seed uh, in, down in, in that soil and stuff that's just waiting for the right conditions for things to happen. Um, and once those things start to happen um, and you foster that and don't, don't plant, you know, some commercial tree operation on it or something like that. Um, all of a sudden, all these, you know, all these birds come back, all this, all this different diversity happens. Um, and then people get an opportunity to enjoy it too. They can, they can go out yeah. the golf course. They can, you know, whether they're playing golf or whether there's trails through the golf course, things like that. Uh, and that's a, that's one of the great things here at seven mile is that this area is, is basically, um, locked off. I mean, you can go in you can walk in or you could, you know, you could go around the thing and ride your mountain bike through there or something, but really this area, it's a, it's a public reserve, but it's not really open to the public. Um, you know, it was covered with trees. There's a sand mine on a portion of the, of the area that not near, you know, it borders the golf course, not right on the golf course or anything, but, um, within this development. So this is going to provide an opportunity for, um, there's horse riders that are in horse farms that are nearby and they, they go down the shore and use, utilize that. And Matt's uh, father was a, he was a trainer, uh, you know, a horse trainer. And so Matt's like, yeah, we want you to ride down with your horse and, you know, hitch it up and come have a coffee and, you know, see the view or, you know, come down and have lunch. Um, even if you're not a golfer, you know, come see this amazing place and, you know, go to the beach and, you know, check things out. So it's a, it's a really, really neat opportunity. Hobart's an amazing town. Really fantastic. I'm in. I'm riding my horse right on down there. So is Seven Mile the name of the area or is that going to be the name of the course as well? Yeah. So, uh, it's the name of, it's the name of the, of the resort. Yeah. Seven Mile Beach. Um, it's actually a peninsula that's seven miles long. So on the Southern side of that is it's seven miles. That's called Seven Mile Beach. On the north side of the peninsula, it's five miles long. And that's called Five Mile Beach. No, <laughs> so <laughs> big shocker, right? So but once you get to five miles, you know where you are. Either um, so it's um, yeah, and and uh, Matt's just started the process to for another adjoining section that would be on the five mile to have um, to have that. He's gone through the first phase of doing that, so it's not just going to be one golf course. You know, we're looking at he wants to do more than that. So um, what's the, that's, a, what's the state of the resort? Is it ready to go? I mean, when can we come play? Uh, well, we're, we're hoping to open, um, about a year from now. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that just depends on mother nature and you know, how fast growing happens and things like that. So, well, it, um, it may be a soft opening. It may be into 2024. Um, as far as like the development of the resort and things like that, they're working on, um, we, there's no construction yet on the clubhouse. Um, but those facilities are in process of being designed and approved and et cetera. So, well, the pictures, yeah. some pictures are starting to leak out, uh, for folks that are, um, follow, um, Mike Clayton, I think, uh, has been posting some, well, any, I don't know who's been posting, but I've been seeing a couple of pics there. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and people are sort of marveling over the fact that they can actually, um, you know, it's, it seems up there with, and maybe surpasses Pebble beach with the kind of, as a place that you can actually play, uh, and one of those rare settings that isn't, um, cut off from, from the golfing public. So super exciting stuff. Um, you mentioned Michigan, Mike. And so we want to talk to you about your roots in Michigan, certainly about the story, the great story you wrote in golfers journal, um, 22 about crystal downs. I see you're wearing, is that your Michigan tea? You bet. Could you give us the, I guess, I, I suppose the abbreviated version of how does a kid from Saginaw, Michigan, end up building golf courses in Tasmania? Yeah. So um, what happened was uh, I, I grew up, um, my grandparents were members at Crystal Downs and I was, you know, I just learned the game from them when I was six, eight years old, whatever, and would follow them around and uh, played a local, little local nine hole course called Frankfurt Golf Club which is a kind of a quirky, you know, a couple of periscopes on it and things like that, but it was a, you know, fun place and, and kids were, you know, welcome and all that. And, uh, and then when I was got older, I, when I was 14, I started subbing in the bag room and, uh, working for Fred in the pro shop and Fred, Fred Muller was the 
longtime pro there. Legend. Um, just just retired a couple of years ago, and um, uh, just you know worked with him. Then worked on the grounds crew and uh, finished college. Did something else. Figured out their mission, life, and mine were different. Came back, got married up there, and uh, went back to the golf course and did some work on the golf course and kind of figured out at that time that was, you know, how do I do this? And I talked with Fred and he said, well, have you met Tom Doak? And I'm like, no, who's that? <laughs> Tom was doing the, he was doing his first, his first course high point. Yeah. And the guy that had been my, uh, been the superintendent at Crystal Downs, been my boss for five years. He had, he had left Crystal Downs and he was running that project for Tom. And so I went over there and I met, I met, um, met Tom and we went off and, um, you know, for camping for two months, uh, on our honeymoon, everyone thought we were crazy. You know, we, we didn't really have jobs or homes and, you know, we went camping for, got married young at 24 and <laughs> but all of a sudden, um, you know, and then I'm building golf courses with Tom and, and everyone's like, what are they, what's he going to do when they stop building golf courses? And so, you know, <laughs> you know, it's sort of been this crazy journey, but I came back and it's helped them finish up, um, at high point, just not really, you know, it wasn't designed at that point or anything. It was really just maintenance and getting, getting the golf course ready for opening, uh, and went to, then went to Myrtle beach and worked for Tom down there on the Heathlands, um, course at the legends complex and then came back and ran the job for the black forest. And then we didn't have another project to go to. And so I went back to school and that's when I went to Michigan and got my degree in landscape architecture and did independent stuff in, in and amongst that in Michigan, there was a lot of building going on. One of those was a Fazio course up at treetops, which is a big resort in, in mm -hmm. Gaylord, Michigan. And uh, got to know some of the guys there, you know, in their organization um, through that opportunity. And when I finished college, I ended up working for Mr. Fazio for about uh, 15 months or so. Uh, they needed somebody to be on site for a couple different projects. One of those was Hudson National out in, in New York, you know, real high end private golf course. And the other one was the Cordillera Valley Club out in uh, just just west of Vail, Colorado. And so, um, and they needed somebody on site to, you know, sort of coordinate the design. And that's not, a, that wasn't sort of a, I don't think that was a typical thing that they did at that time, you know, to have somebody there every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that was, I did that and then, um, came back to Michigan and, you know, been doing my own stuff ever since then and ended up, um, we, we were looking for, you know, where we wanted to live and raise our kids and things like that. We had a, we had a young daughter at that time. Our son wasn't born yet. Um, and Travers was kind of a logical spot, even though I wasn't working for Tom and he, he lived there. Um, but it's easy to fly in and out of. Um, it was close to family, um, you know, and picking this life, it's, it's, everyone thinks it's really glamorous, but you know, you're in a, you're in a plane a lot. <laughs> you're traveling yeah. a lot. That, that isn't necessarily fun all the time. Um, and so, you know, when you get home, you want to be, you want to be where you want to be and near the people you want to be near. And, um, that made it, that made it a pretty, um, logical choice to do that. It's pretty amazing that Chris, so I guess if you go back to the root of it, it's Crystal Downs, um, introduced yeah. or, or was your initial attachment and same with, you know, how Tom ends up, uh, in, in Traverse city, uh, the pull of Crystal Downs. And we're going to, we're going to dive in on Crystal Downs in just a moment. But your golf as an architect, so your background working with Tom Doak, also working with Tom Fozio, with Tom Fazio, which is sort of I don't know that might are there a lot of architects that would have that sort of. So I always think of like the the sort of like the coaching tree in the NFL, right? You know, the yeah. descendants of, of people who worked with Pete Dye over here, and then the people who worked with Fazio like over here. And yeah, um, yeah. but you crisscross. Right, because Doak working with Pete Dye, yeah, you working with Doak and then working with Fazio. We don't like those uh, guys. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but you're, yeah. So you uh, you played on both teams, if you will. Um, what was explain? You know what might differentiate that experience, uh, the Fazio approach and 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 maybe the Doak approach, because they would seem to be different. The, the end product seems different. I don't know if there's something that. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, they are different the way they approach things. And certainly, 
you know, have, growing up and working at Crystal Downs and on the grounds crew really for about uh, eight years, um, you know, I was always outdoors and building stuff and mowing grass and doing that sort of thing. So, so Tom's approach kind of coming from Pete Dye and, you know, being on site and building stuff and being involved that way and things kind of, um, you know, the, the design evolves kind of as, as you sort of peel, peel back the layers a bit in some cases, um, that, you know, that led to, because of my connection with my former superintendent and then, you know, meeting Tom, you know, young when, you know, you didn't have anybody working for him and, um, you know, getting that start, you know, really helped to solidify that sort of aspect for me, you know, building and being in the field and, Mm -hmm. you know, getting on equipment and, you know, learning how to run bulldozer and all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was really great. And something that I've always enjoyed, um, you know, being outside and being active and stuff. Um, and when I was working on my masters at Michigan, um, Bill Newcomb, who is a golf architect based in Ann Arbor, um, he, Bill was a really good player back in the day, uh, won the Indiana open as a, as an amateur played in the, played in the masters back then. Um, he, he, you know, he was a, he was a plan oriented guy, you know, I mean, he had guys in the field and he visited and stuff, but he, and I worked with him one summer, just drawing plans, you know, doing mm-hmm. that. So totally different than, than Tom Doak's sort of approach. And, uh, and then, you know, getting out and working with Tom Fazio where they, you know, they're very plan based, but they also have a lot of involvement in the field and they're, and they're highly involved, um, you know, with providing documentation, but also, um, sort of doing things in the field, um, to sort of adjust and make, you know, make changes to that. So they're not that rigid where they don't analyze things and say, you know, Hey, we need to change because of this. How can we do that? Um, but they're, uh, yeah, you know, Mr. Mr. Fazio was, uh, he was, you know, he was doing the biggest budgets, the biggest clients. Um, you know, there was a lot more glitz involved with it, you know, then, uh, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a dirt guy, you know, <laughs> <out there. laughs> right. but the, but the amazing thing about that was he was, um, he was very comfortable. It was very comfortable for me to like walk down a fairway and to ask questions or to talk about, um, you know, what are we trying to do here? This or that, if I didn't, you know, like the very first sort of interview, like walking, you know, what's walking the property and seeing if this was going to be a fit for me to you know work with them. Um, I felt comfortable asking questions and, or suggesting something or whatever it, I didn't feel intimidated. He he doesn't, he's very, he makes people feel very comfortable and Mm -hmm. he's wants to get the best product. You know, he's always focused on that. Um, and so they're, they work very differently. Um, and, but you know, they're both trying to achieve greatness. Now, whether their definition of greatness is different, you know, I mean, most people would say that, you know, they're in two different camps and things like that. Um, but striving to get the best product out of it and finding solutions for that, uh, I think is, you know, that's, that's why they're both at the top of the field, um, yeah. is to try and get that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's what, that's what I'm trying. That's what I've always been trying to do. So, um, that's, 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 so, you know, that, that's a bedrock sort of thing that, you know, you can fall back on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so those are, you know, would you consider them two of your mentors? Absolutely. Among, among others. And so if you had to point to specific, something specific that you take from Tom Doak, Tom Fazio, or another mentor, um, what, what might that be? So, well, that's a good question. Tough. Um, yeah, lots of different stuff. I think you know, from both of them, you know, as a belief in, your concept or, you know, idea and how you can, um, you know, propose that. I mean, I think, um, not that it's a fight, but, you know, you want to present your ideas and you want to, and you want to have good discussion about that. Um, maybe that's just cause I'm a, you know, <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest and I'm just sort of, you know, Hey, these are the facts. Let's, let's try and, you know, do that. But I think, that bodes well, you know, in any project that you're, that you're working on. And, um, I think, 
those sorts of things lead to finding the right solution. Sometimes that, you know, crazy idea or an opinion or whatever doesn't necessarily end up being the right solution or answer to whatever problem is going on there, but it may lead you down the road to finding the right solution. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do is how, how do we, how do we build things that engage golfers on all levels? It's not about it, for me, it's not personally about, Oh, this shot value is really hard. That's what we're testing here or something. You know, I'm, you know, that's pretty difficult to do for how far these kids hit the ball nowadays. So can we engage golfers? I think to me, that's the most important thing. And I've talked a lot with, you know, recently with Matt about that because Matt's, you know, he was a top 50 golfer in the world. I mean, he's a super high level player. Yeah. And so he wants to challenge those guys, but he, you know, he wants this to be for everybody too. And so I've talked a lot about how can we, how can we build stuff that engages people, whether they, whether it's, you know, somebody's grandmother, whether it's some young kid, whether it's a young um, accomplished player, um, whether it's just, you know, it's four guys going out, you know, having a good time and a few beers while they're playing. How can we engage them all? Because if you're engaged, you're going to like the golf and you're going to want to come back. And Seven Mile Beach is that spectacular. You're going to want to come back anyway. So, yeah. I want to be engaged. And, I mean, that's a, yeah, that sounds like a, a perfect um, and ideal ambition for sure. How When you get to a property, when you get to this beautiful Seven Mile, <laughs> this resort, um, whether it's covered with trees or not, uh, when you get to this spot, where does it start? How do you how do you go about saying this is how we're going to make an engaging golf course? What do you see first? Well, I think well you try and understand the you know, try and understand the land first. That's the first thing you got to do. It's not necessarily um, this spot or that spot. I mean, you're trying to just understand what that land has inherently. So whether it's a hilly piece of property, oceanfront, flat ground, every property has something that you can find to work off of or to be distinguishing and to provide some sort of direction for what you want to do. And, uh, when you think about, when you think like people are always like, Oh, that's a really flat golf course, really flat site. Well, St. Andrews is flat, but it's constantly moving and, you know, rolling and pitching and, you know, doing all this stuff, right. It doesn't move very much, but if you, on a flat piece of ground, if you move two feet up, it feels like a lot where that would be totally lost, it would feel flat on a hilly piece of property. Mm -hmm. um, so you're trying to, you're just trying to understand the property. At least that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what, what is it inherently about this piece of property? What can we, what we, can we glean from that to create interesting golf? How can we utilize that? And so in the instance of Seven Mile Beach here, um, we've got these, great dunes and in some places really crazy choppy up and down it's covered in trees we know the ocean's right there you can hear the ocean but you can't see it and you, you know you get some places where it get a little thinner and you and you get a sense of oh this is well, that's a cool green site we can kind of see that in this area but um how, how can we get there you know where, where can we come from that and that's how you start to i think kind of evolve whole concepts and then you try and figure out how to put those pieces together. Where, how does the puzzle work? Yeah. And well, in, talk, in terms of an engaging piece of property and an engaging golf course, you've designed one of my, uh, I don't know, I'd say top five in America for me. Uh, and one of the most engaging, uh, I think, because that's the word. I mean, it's interesting to hear you use that word because if the Kingsley Club is anything, it is engaging from yeah. the first tee onward. It has your full attention. Um, it's just an absolute accomplishment. And and it's just, uh, it was one of my favorite days in golf. Uh, I had the chance this past summer, I went up, I did a sort of Northern Michigan exploration. Crystal Downs was part of that. But, um, you know, got to go around to Belvedere and, um, man, Northern Michigan is stacked, uh, with incredible, incredible golf. If only the, the season was longer, I guess, but Kingsley tops the, would top the list, at, at least as far as I'm concerned in my limited experience. Um, 
What were well, you that's trying not, that's to... That's not really limited, though, is it, Tom? Come on. <laughs> it's, not, it's not terribly limited. <laughs> yeah, right? I meant limited in my Michigan experience. I know there are a couple, like, there are some courses I, I have not gotten to in Michigan. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, my, my no complaints on uh, where I've been able to get to. But getting to a property like Kingsley, what was that like? What were your goals and you know, what were you setting out to try and accomplish? And do you feel like you did? Yeah, well, first of all, it's great to hear you. You know, it sounds like you just had super fun, you know, and that's the highest compliment You're anybody fun. can give me. Yeah, you know, I had fun. Well, that's what it's all about. Um, so um, so there were two owners there, um, Ed Walker and Art Preston. Uh, Mr. Preston passed away a few years ago. Um, Ed Walker was his uh, business partner in years, and he, he lives in Traverse City year-round full-time. And um, so he was kind of sort of the manager. He was really more of the, you know, the owner um, and guy that was involved. And uh, when I first met him, you know, his, he said his goal was that he and Art wanted to build a, you know, a, a golf course that um, rivals, you know, the best courses in the country. They, you know, they played all over the world and they wanted to have a place to call home. And if this piece of property, which Ed had found, used like in a newspaper ad one Sunday and they went out and looked at it and it had been, been clear cut 15 years before then. So it was regrowth with just a thicket of, you know, fire cherry, 15, 12, 15 foot whips, you know, just like so dense, you couldn't even walk through it in places. So it was really difficult to get a sense of that. We did have topo maps and things, but there were, I cut some trails through it and he said, you know, if this, piece of property isn't where we can do it, then we'll find another piece of property and I'll bird hunt here because it's, it's really good pheasant, you know, cover. (laughs) So, um, so, uh, you know, we, we spent about six months trying to really go through and, and, and be diligent about that. And, um, we, you know, we figured out we had a really good opportunity to do that. And, uh, Fred Muller, who I, you know, mentioned before was the longtime pro at Crystal Downs. He was a, he was good friends with, uh, with Mr. Preston, who was a member at Crystal Downs and, and also knew Ed, you know, through, through Mr. Preston. So, um, he, he, and, you know, Fred had been a very influential guy in, in my career and, uh, understanding of golf just, you know, it taught me the game really, you know, the formal training, uh, when I worked, you know, worked there and stuff. And, um, so Fred was kind of a, you know, he was kind of a consultant and involved in the process and a, and a guy that I could always call on to, you know, go through things and talk about him. And, and so that was very helpful from that standpoint. Um, and you know, the owners were very involved too. I mean, as, as they usually are, I mean, they're investing a lot of money. A lot of times it's a dream for them in this case, you know, they want to create a, a great place for golf. And that's really their focus was just about golf. It wasn't about developing housing and, you know, any of that other stuff. So, um, and it took, it took, it took a while to do that. And then we, we built the course over two years and, um, you know, it was 20, 25 minutes from my house. And I'm never going to be that close to another project. I don't think, um, from my home. <laughs> so, that, so that's always, that's always a bonus. Um, and it, and it was, it, it took a lot of time. I mean, it's a difficult piece of property to flow well, but I think, I think we succeeded really well in doing that. So it's very, it's, it's, it's more, you know, even though you look at the first hole and it's a big par five and there's the crazy bunkers in the middle of the fairway and it's a hundred yards wide and there's this big hill and you think, oh, this is not walkable. It actually is a, a pretty good walk. Um, once you get past sort of that first hill climb. Right. It is. Well, yeah, that first hole grabs your attention. Um, It's just crazy. It's wild topography, you know? Um, And did you have to move? I was always, I was wondering if you had to move much of it or if you were, there are, there are things that you couldn't construct. I mean, I, what hole is it on the back nine that has a ski slope going down it? Um, (laughs) Yeah. Number number 17. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, Yeah. Like if you have fear of heights and went to the edge of it, you'd be like, what the hell? Um, and that's in the fairway. So, I mean, there's just wild fun stuff there. 
And I guess, you know, as an architect, to have owners who are cool with that, it's got to be a good... I, it, it reminded me, and I mean, I mean this is his highest compliment, that it had like a Tobacco Road vibe to it in that it just had this sort of whimsical nature to it uh, where you're talking about just pure fun um, yeah. and, and sort of land forms and structures that you'd probably um, wouldn't build and but you just let be and, and they just create unusual like golf holes you haven't really seen before um and as someone who sees a lot of golf holes that is such such an absolute treat uh and i think you know uh kingsley's just just full of them and and that's got to be incredibly cool too to have the pros so you i mean you're working in the bag room at crystal downs growing up there and then you're working with the pro consulting on building golf a golf course down the road um that relationship has got to be pretty special yeah, Fred's, um, you know, he's truly one of my, you know, one of my dearest friends, um, you know, and a, and a mentor and a friend and, um, you know, companion and, you know, teacher and someone, you know, that I can call up any day, you know, and just shoot the breeze. Um, and, you know, that's a, you know, I've been real lucky in those types of things to have those opportunities of guys that, um, you know, in the business, whether that's, you know, Tom Fazio, Tom Doak, um, Tom Mead, who was the superintendent at Crystal Downs for those five years, I was saying, and then got into the golf business and worked with Tom Doak. Um, you know, I learned a lot. He was a great superintendent. And all the superintendents that I work with on these projects, um, you know, we try and get them on board, you know, from day one um, of, you know, the planning, not just construction, because those guys are really integral to getting the job done and done right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because they have to, you know, they have to maintain this long term. We have to build something that's sustainable and that they have to understand what we're trying to do so they don't just come in and like change things randomly. And um, so I've been really fortunate to, you know, be blessed with um, a lot of guys doing that from um, Dan Lucas at, at Kingsley. Um, who built the golf course with me is still there, still still taking care of the golf course. One of the best, if not the best turf guy I've ever seen in my life. He just knows how to grow grass to play golf. Not, he doesn't care what color it is or, you know, how many varieties it's, how does it play? So, yeah. you know, and, and Kingsley, that's what it's really about. I mean, they're, you know, there's, a, there are guys that are golfers there and they're not necessarily all great golfers. You know, there's average golfers there, but they're golfers. They love the game. And, you know, they, they're really engaged on that, on that factor. Um, Until they get to the ninth green, (laughs) like, like the game anymore. The toughest part, the toughest short part three in America. I hit it and made, I had to look at two. I was into it, man. I'm like, this is freaking, this hole's great. (laughs) It's awesome. Yeah, this is awesome. But the guys are with it. Like, oh, you're going to hate this hole. Um, So much character. But they're like the, the list of like great people. In, in your life, um, you know, that have had a, had a role um, and, and pushed you in, you know, in, in good directions um, because you're a good person. And I always think of like, you know, why do some people have that sort of success? There's a lot of people who want to be golf course architects and have a career like you're having. Um, that's their dream and their, and their life's goal. And I'm not saying that they're not good people and that's why it doesn't happen for them. But um, I don't know. I always find that like, you know, people like yourself and Tom Doak and Gil Hans, um, sorry, Gil, uh, Gil and David McClay kid and, and others, you're really good people. And that attracts other good people who want to work with you. And when good people get together, they do good things. Is that sort of, that might be sort of an oversimplification, like a greeting card view of the world, but, um, it doesn't, I'm not, you know, I find that that is a common theme among the people that we have on the podcast that have this rare success. Um, that first off, whether they be talent, especially talented or intelligent or have different kinds of gifts, the first thing that they are is generally good people. Good people attract other good people to be around them, and good people make good things. And isn't maybe an oversimplified view of it, but I don't know. You're a good guy, and I can, I can see that that's why good things are happening for you. Well, thanks. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a, it's a half full sort of mentality, right? You know, yeah. and, and, and if you have a half full, how do we make it full, full, you know, so what do we take and what do we extract from that? So that, 
it's just like thinking about how do we glean as much as we can out of a piece of property. And you know, Clates and I, we're down here at Seven Mile Beach and you know, we're looking at hole X, doesn't matter which one it is really. And and I'm talking about the stuff we're building and Clates is down about every other week. And so he and he turns and he, and he goes, oh, that's a great shot over there. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Let's focus three back on this because everywhere we turn, <laughs> there's a great, there's a great shot or a great I hole. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was sort of like, um, how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you take that half glass and how do you make it fuller? You know, yeah. and you're gleaning that from, and that's what I was talking about with regards to like the superintendents and, and Anthony Tugood, who's down here at Seven Mile Beach, um, came from a, a, just like Matt Goggin, a great golfing family. Matt's mom was, a, was one of the leading amateurs ever from Australia and Tasmania and, and Anthony Tugood, Tui is his nickname. His dad, Peter Tugood, was similarly one of the greatest male golfers ever to come out of Tasmania. Won the first um, Eisenhower at St. Andrews back in 1956 or something. And so Tui is a mm-hmm. really he's a really good player himself. Went to went to school in the states at Middle Tennessee and you know played golf there and um, and he's been a superintendent for you know how many years and you know he got down here and I said, you know, Hey, I, you know, whatever you see or things that you, you know, want to do, I'm like, you know, I, I want you to tell me. And he's like, I don't, I'm not the golf architect. I don't want to do that. He was like, I'm like, no, I want you to, you know, what you can do and contribute is you can help us make it better and understand how it is. Or if you see something that isn't um, very, you know, doable for you or difficult, how can we maybe modify that, but keep the philosophy, you know, and that happens a lot. You mentioned a 17 at Kingsley where there's that steep hill. And I took Dan Lucas there. It was forest at the time. And we're looking, there's a trail cut through there. That was an old gas pipeline trail. And I pointed to this hill and I said, can you mow that? And he, he goes, you mean it's fairway? And I said, yeah, he goes, yeah, with, with four wheel drive and I'm going to have that because of all the other crazy stuff you're building. So, so, <laughs> so yeah, we could do it. And so that's why it's, you know, that's, you know, finding a way, right. To do something yeah. that's really um, kind of unique and draws from that land and then makes it, you know, we find a way to make it work. And so, you know, you crest the hill on 17 and you go all the way to the bottom and you only have 165 yards in, but yeah, it's uphill and it's a little downhill lie. And like my ball flight, I can't get it on the green from that, even if it's 165 yards. But um, if I'm back up on top of the hill, I might have a chance hitting the three wood. <laughs> True. <laughs> so yeah. we made, I made birdie from the, I didn't get, I didn't go down the hill. Um, God, it's such a cool hole. That was such a fun day of golf, but that's great. I mean, it's great advice and, or not that you're giving advice, but a great lesson to think about taking advice from, from all sorts of people listening to their input, not taking it as criticism, um, but being more being collaborative. Um, so something that you, you know, why we got you onto the podcast, you wrote this wonderful piece, uh, in golfers journal 22 about crystal Downs. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about crystal downs. Um, we already have, but, uh, you know, the golf course that has essentially to some extent launched two great architecture careers, um, and done a lot more, uh, and, uh, is, is really one of the unique spots in golf. Now you've known it before people knew it as such, um, before it was discovered. And and you do write about that in this yardage book feature about Crenshaw discovering it, putting it on the map, Tom Doak continuing that, um, putting, you know, by writing about it uh, and people start to discover crystal downs and wanting to um, experience it. Well, first I should ask you a downs. What is a downs? I, I mean, we have, we, right. Like I've tried, yeah. I've, I've read specific definitions of what a downs is and I can't find any consensus of how I could connect crystal downs to say, I don't know, Churchill downs. There are different downs out there. And yeah. uh, what is that landform? You have the masters. So I'm asking you. <laughs> well, not in downs, but, um, but <laughs> my understanding, you know, downs is a, is a section of, um, of England, sort of where they call that rolling landscape 
the downs. And I don't really have it. It's I don't have anything more specific than that, really. In my yeah, understanding. generally rolling landscape without yeah. a lot of trees on it. Yeah. I think was the and was so uh, Walkley Ewing, who was the founder of Crystal Downs, um, one of his friends um, back in this is the twenties um, before Mackenzie was ever there and all that. This is because they they actually it was a real estate development. This this guy Walkley Ewing was a young real estate developer, and he had remembered seeing this property when he and his brother had hiked up the eastern shore of Lake Michigan um, all the way, you know, from down south all the way up north, which is 300 and some miles. And he just really remembered this remarkable spot there just north of Point Betsy, uh, which where the golf course is. And there was two farmsteads there. And so some of the land was was open ground and some of it was forested. Uh, but you could see that. And so when he ended up purchasing the land, the, the land from the, the farmers and to doing this development, one of his friends, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, um, said that they were trying to figure out what to call it. And obviously Crystal Lake was there and the water's crystal clear blue, you know, at Lake Michigan and Crystal Lake and stuff. So Crystal was always going to be part of the name of the development. And then, but his friend sort of waved his hand and said, this, this reminds me of the Downs in England. So what about Crystal Downs? And so that's how the club got its name. It's a great and, name. And, what, and it is pretty unique when you stand up by the clubhouse. Um, it's I've been there twice. It's never been open. Um, but we've sat outside. <laughs> it. It's a funny club because there's few, you know, it's a very small membership, very yeah. seasonal. Um, so it's a very different vibe there. Very welcoming, but um, it's, it's, different um but you're standing up there and you can see the two lakes um, yeah it's wild like you know these two huge lakes and and all these great duny landforms everywhere and then of course the golf course spilling out uh from from the clubhouse uh it's just what makes it so special well that it's that point of land and you, yeah. what you said there um you know it's this it's this meeting of land and sea, or in this case, lake. And then you throw in Alistair McKenzie and Perry Maxwell as his, you know, associate and day-to-day, -day, you know, coordinator for the when the project was built. Um, so you put two of the greatest architects on one of the greatest pieces of ground and pretty lucky that's what you get. Um, you know, I'm just fortunate my family, you know, a long time ago on a in the teens, 1916, I think was the first time my great grandfather was up in the area, unrelated to Crystal Downs, just um, until my family's, you know, been visiting there for a long, long time. And um, so I just, you know, it was the call, the, the club has a very relaxed, um, you know, unassuming type of, um, you know, mentality. Um, and 40 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, that was even more relaxed. You know, it was just, there's always been people that have um, been very successful business people, doctors and lawyers and stuff like that, that would go there because it's a big summer area. You know, Northern Michigan, there's a lot of cottages, whether you're in, um, you know, Frankfurt or up near Traverse City, um, Leelanau County, up to Harbor Springs and, you know, Petoskey area and all that. And um, people, you know, they, they got out of the hot cities in the summer. They didn't have air conditioning a hundred years ago. So they went North for a month or something. And, um, you know, a simpler time. And I think that's, that's the reaction of the golf course, um, where it's very, very laid back. And, and like when I was growing up and working in the bag room, uh, we had the chairman of the board of standard oil, Indiana was, playing golf with the postmaster of Frankfurt, Michigan, <laughs> hmm. yeah. you know, you wouldn't think that that would be the normal thing that you would see at some urban country club in one of, in a big city. You wouldn't. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was a very, you know, it was, it was, it was really neat. Um, everybody was, you know, super friendly. They always, they always knew I was Bob Payette's grandson. Oh, how, you know, how's your grandfather doing? You know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's pretty special. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. 
that's a heartfelt kind of thing, you know, to have that experience that and to realize that people are people, no matter, you know, what, what class of, you know, society they're in and, um, and good people treat, treat people well, treat people right. That's just, that's just yep. the way, that's the way life is. So that was, that was really, um, important and fortunate to have those, those types of, uh, relationships and, you know, meaningful things with that. Um, you know, I just, I'm just really lucky that, you know, that I had that opportunity to do that. Um, yeah. you know, I also saw the other thing in Grand Rapids when I went back to, you know, school in the fall, um, and, you know, I'd go play the, the local <laughs> little golf course that, you know, wasn't much at all. You know, some, uh, my mom or my friend's mom, they, he, they'd drop my buddy and I, and we'd go play this little muni golf course, you know? So, you know, that was fun too. It was, it was just golf. So you play it against your, against your friend, right? Um, hundred percent, whether yeah. it was for a dime or nothing or whatever, just the pride of, you know, Hey, I got you today. <laughs> no doubt about it. And that's, and what a great, that's, yeah. that's one of the things that makes the club really good. And then the golf course itself, um, we could do three hours on talking about different ways to dissect that, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I know, and I want to, but I'm not gonna, I know, but you have to watch but <laughs> Michigan's coming on. I don't want to keep you right through there. Uh, they'll probably be far enough ahead by the time we're finished, but in any event, um, it is such a special golf course, but yeah, the vibe, like you said, it's, you know, that's, I was surprised when I went there and realized like, this is kind of like a summer lake community with a golf, like a resort golf course for the summer lake community and all the members, if I'm I have to, uh, if I'm not wrong, you, you have to have a property in the County or the area. So it's, there is, it keeps, you have to have a connection. Yeah. 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 You can't just, um, you can't just, you can't just write a check and join, you know, you have to be sort of committed to the area and have a, have a place within a, a certain right. locality. Yes. To be. So it's not going to be a national membership where it's like the top hundred CEOs all play here, this, that, and the other kind. It's not like that at all. Like you said, there are certainly successful people there, but I met a lot of people who are just like, like you're, like you said, like my grandfather joined here when he bought a cab, like a, a house down by the lake for $1,500. You yeah. know, and it's like, yeah. like way to go, grandpa. You know, grandpa, because yeah. uh, you can't get into this place now, especially now that the golf world has has discovered it. Um, and and now, gosh, to have that Lenny, how did that? How did Perry Maxwell and Alistair McKenzie get together? It seems like a little bit of odd bedfellows, at least at least from where they're maybe from in the world. Um, how does that happen? Uh, well, my understanding is that um, uh, McKenzie had been coming through. Um, you know, across from England and he went across the States and he, I'm trying to remember if it was Melrose that he saw or whatever. And I haven't been there uh, in, in Pennsylvania. And it was the thing that, that Perry Maxwell had done. And somehow they made this connection and, um, you know, got, you know, in touch with each other, you know, <laughs> probably just regular letters or whatever post. And, um, you know, McKenzie, like he did everywhere, he sort of got a guy who he felt was talented and was, you know, was really good and was able to take that person and mold them and, you know, use them for projects they did. So, uh, McKen McKenzie, you know, ultimately got this intro and the story goes that, um, Mr. Just to sort of talk about um, the history of Crystal Downs. So Walkley Ewing, he had a nine hole golf course built by Eugene Goble, who was a park planner down in Grand Rapids. Uh, and he designed this nine hole golf course and it was pretty rudimentary. And Walkley Ewing read Robert Hunter's The Lynx. And he figured out, oh, this maybe, maybe we have an opportunity to do something a little bit different and better. And he writes Robert Hunter and <laughs> and asks him for advice and tells him about it and says, you know, who would you recommend? And, oh, well, the best is Alistair McKenzie. Now, unbeknownst to Mr. Ewing, that uh, Alistair McKenzie um, and, and Robert Hunter are <laughs> partners out in California. <laughs> so I think I can convince him to stop by uh, on his way back to England, you know, in a month or two or whatever. And so that gets arranged. And by that time, Maxwell is, is sort of the Midwest associate for 
uh, for McKenzie. And, you know, they've corresponded, not really done designs, but, you know, they've sort of worked together on some things. And um, so Maxwell comes, Walkley Ewing picks him up, drives, you know, McKenzie's kind of flabbergasted and disgruntled of having to go to this godforsaken place in Michigan. It can't be anything good here. <laughs> so Walkley Ewing immediately drives towards the towards Lake Michigan and he starts seeing these sand dunes and they're like, is this it? You know, they start getting excited. Right. And finally they get up to, to Frankfurt and you know, the story goes that he's so enamored with it that they stay for two weeks and he does the plan, the drawings and all that. And then Maxwell comes back. Uh, that's, that's the fall of 28. Maxwell comes back in 1929 and they build the front nine that, that first season. And then the crash hits and it takes them, another two seasons to build the back nine, essentially. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting how Alistair McKenzie is so great at being able to be someplace for a short period of time, whether that's, you know, Argentina, Australia, um, you know, going through Michigan and, 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 distributing enough information and, and getting that across to other people that are talented that they follow through and do that. And a lot of people want to say, well, you know, it should be an Alistair McKenzie, Perry Maxwell golf course, because Perry did the, you know, he was there every day and, you know, certainly he made changes or this or that, but um, Alistair is the guy that, you know, made the decision, you know? Um, and yeah. You know, I was on the job every day for the Black Forest, you know, running the project for Tom Doak, but it's not a Mike DeRee's golf course. I mean, it's a Tom Doak golf course. Come on. You know, <laughs> right. you, know um, you know, that's, that's, that's just, that's the way things are. And that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. So now what about this? Not nothing wrong with it at all. What about the story, the legend about the ninth hole <laughs> um, that, so folks don't know. And you, Crystal Downs, it's front nine, known for this great string of short par fours. Uh, and you wrote about one, the sixth hole, in Yardage Book. Uh, and it was a great, great piece. And I want to touch on that in a second. Um, but the ninth hole is a par three uphill. Um, very uphill. Little, <laughs> very, very uphill yeah. as you're getting working with finally getting back up to like the pro shop. Um, and it... F I don't know. It's a little, it's a little squeezed in there, but it works. And, uh, I think it's a cool, it's a very cool hole. Um, of course the legend being that McKenzie is, it was told to me, uh, goes to show Maxwell how he's laid out the front nine and how great it is. Um, maybe he had, was in his cups a little bit and Maxwell reads it and says, there's only eight holes here. And he says, Oh shit. And uh, so he's all right, here's the ninth. Um, but I, I know you've heard that story. So what do you think of it? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's part of the lore or not, but that, that, that was recounted specifically, uh, by Mr. Baird, who was an old long, long, long time member from way back Oh, really? Uh, that he wrote in the history. Yeah. And supposedly, you know, this is prohibition. It's 28. So right. supposedly um, they weren't run out of scotch or whatever Mackenzie was drinking. And he sends Maxwell to town to, you know, and he, Maxwell comes back and I got it. I got it. You know, he's figured out the front nine. And then Maxwell goes, this, there's only eight holes. Oh, well, here we go. Okay. So, <laughs> so there's the night, the afterthought, which is actually a great hole. And it, it, it is. it's 28 feet uphill from the back tee to the middle of the green, which is really severe. Um, I it mean, makes the, sense the tee itself there, is, the tee itself has five or six feet of elevation on it. Um, yeah. just because there's a funky front part of it that used to be, that was a section that was part of the old global ninth hole. And that's where the very forward tee is there. Now uh -huh. they left that in place and then put in the rest of the tee and stuff. So, um, it's a great, um, yeah, it's a great story. Great hole. That's where I had my first hole in one, actually. Um, hey, well, yeah. you like that hole. Yeah, so yeah, it's a great hole. <laughs> it is a great hole. And gosh, and being right on Lake Michigan, probably no chance, no shortage of booze coming into uh, into old Michigan in those days across from the across from the north. Um, but yeah, it is a great hole. And how would you get to? I mean, how would you get back up to ten T? Uh, yeah. So it's. Uh, 
it's a cool hole. What about the fact that you allude to it in your article? So uh, folks that aren't familiar with with Crystal Downs, um, and that would be most of us, uh, there's front and back are quite different. Well, I would say that, you know, whatever, 12 through 16 on the back are are on a like almost on like a different piece of the property. And what about what would you say to someone who knocks Crystal Downs because it's a hall? It's such a great walk. The golf course is such a great walk. And then you finish 11 and you're like, shit, I wish there was a tram here. Or they, should, <laughs> and they should put a call. There's a, really needs to be a shuttle here. Yeah. Um, because it, you go to this other piece of the property where there are these other, you know, five, six really cool golf holes. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's just the way the part the property is. Um, it, yeah. and, and from, yeah, the, the 12th tee is the highest point on the property and the eighth hole is, at the beginning of the eighth hole is the lowest point on the property and it's about 205 feet in elevation. So really the front nine, there's elevation because you start high and you go down, but the way the genius really of, you know, what McKenzie does is he figures out, you know, the rhythm of the property and how that works. And so when you stand up there in the first tee and you get this, you see this spectacular view of the front nine in front That's of you. Beautiful. And you see a bit of Crystal Lake in the, you know, over in the distance. And then you hit this big drive down, massive par four, and you don't, you don't have a view until you get back to nine again. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, the views are spectacular, but it's not about the views, it's about all this great golf. And so that's front nine is like the first act. And then the second act is, is hole 10. You hit this big drive down again. And then from 10, 10 green up to 11 is T is kind of a hall and 11 mm. is a par three again. And that's uphill. Also 11th green Tough. is 20 feet above the T. It doesn't look Tough. that way because there's yeah. a big Valley in front of it. It looks like it's, you know, on the same level, but it's really deceiving that way. And then you got to climb 75 feet in elevation to get up to 12, but it's worth it. It certainly so, is worth it. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of that a, next chunk. It's really, it does fit. That's where I feel like you're really in like that. It almost feels sort of like English. Um, I don't know. I, it felt like Sunningdale back there when, or, or like, um, uh, or, um, gosh, on the, the, the places I just wrote about in the golfer's journal, it, it had this lovely, like just past like flowing pasture back there with these holes yeah. running side by side as, as you work your way out, um, along this, beautiful piece of property and then get back to the drama at 17. Um, and then certainly 18, uh, yeah. where you get these, these wild tee shots that you're asked to hit, um, after playing, you know, something that felt like, um, a sort of countryside golf for a couple of holes. It's very, it's just well, really you, cool. you sort of think about that. So that 12 through 16 up on the plateau there, that's old farmland and, you know, Lake Michigan's right there, yeah. but it was a real estate development. And so those are cottages along that, along that bluff. Just imagine if there weren't cottages there, you'd have holes right on the edge of the bluff, you know, staring Lake Michigan in the face, but that's the thing. That's the interest. So the front nine is act one, act two is 10 out to 14, the far end, the part, the short par three, shortest hole in the course there. That's sort of, and there you get a, you get a view, you get a very limited view, um, to the east and and northeast, and you actually see Lake Michigan from there. You get this view. You see part of Empire Bluffs. That's Act Two, and then Act Three is kind of 15 back, and you culminate um, at 17 Green, which is just you know you're on top of the world. And then 18 down yeah, the yeah. valley below the clubhouse is that's the postlude or the afterward or whatever sort of analogy you want to use for it. So Trying there's this really cut. interesting, yeah. you know. I always, I always think about that and how, you know, I mean, there's how many thousands of times, you know, I've been on the property and walked the golf course and, you know, just, I learned something about golf architecture every time I'm there. And that could be sledding off the first tee on New Year's day with my kids. Cause I see things in a different way. You see the, you see the contour and the ground in front of two, two green differently when you're going over snow on it. <laughs> You know, wow. just, just having fun, you know, so that's a good, really cool point. Yeah. What a, what a great place. And 
Um, you know, to have Kingsley and Crystal Downs, I mean, how far are they apart from each other? Yeah, you know, about 50 minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah. Not very far. I would say, yeah. you know, in terms of um, exciting and fun golf courses, um, that would be the two. I don't know if there's a, a, a one two punch like that really anywhere uh, for my taste, what I'm into. Uh, they're just awesome, just golf holes that you step up and look at and you smile. And yeah. uh, you don't have to, and you don't have to know anything about templates or golf course architecture or anything to appreciate that like this is just going to be a whole hell of a lot of fun um you write about one of those holes uh that's immediately recognizable as a super fun hole uh number six of crystal downs uh in golfers journal 22 uh i'll just quickly ask you about that i mean it's a great it's a great short par four uh bending to the right over you got to carry some stuff and pick line you know pick a pick the right line to, you know, a couple trees get involved, um, off the tee. Uh, you know, do you take the more aggressive line? Do you take the safer line? Um, you have to n- n- navigate some, some bunkers. You refer to, uh, the bunkers there is the best fairway bunker complex in the world, which is pretty high praise. So I had to go back and I was enjoying studying the pictures. Uh, and you know, I played it a couple times and I think maybe I, I, was just trying to avoid them or that's the thing about <laughs> fairway bunkers, right? It's like, you, you don't want to notice avoid them. them. Yeah. You don't want to notice them. You don't, it's like, how can I, you need to be a golf course architect to appreciate fairway bunkers as beautiful because we're just trying to stay the hell away from them. And I think, you know, in the last, when I've played number six, a couple of times, that's what I've done. What makes those bunkers so special to you? Uh, well, one, uh, the name, the nickname for them is the scabs. <laughs> that is a great name. That so, is a great name. so, um, but they're it, they're benched in this steep hillside, and so there are these really unusual, you know, almost levels that are benched into the hillside on on the on the tee side as you look at it. And there's there's little islands and fingers that go into it and stuff. And it's not really a lot of sand. It, it there isn't room for much sand because it's a really steep hill. And then as it folds over to the top there's a bigger bunker there that has a little Island and a tongue in it and stuff like that also. And, um, so they're just, you know, it's, you know, when you're a kid and you're, you know, you're trying to clear that Hill, um, you know, um, you, you, you gotta stay as close to the bunkers as possible. Cause if you go left, it's a longer carry. And if your ball goes up, it might still roll back 40, 50 yards. And then you're, you know, then there's no chance you have to get home. So, you know, you're, you're trying to flirt with those and you're flirting with a maple tree that guards the left side of those also, because sometimes yeah. you clear it and you get there and then you're stuck behind the big, this big maple tree. And then you're trying yeah, to manufacture right like a little chop shot, like under it and, you know, get it to roll up onto the green. And, you know, so there's all these different dynamics that happen with it. Um, and so it's beautiful. I, there's, yeah. Yeah. There's one hole on the, there's, you know, there's three trees on the hole, uh, on the entire hole. And they're just so perfect, um, yeah. in terms of how they, uh, oh, it's just, it's just such a, it's such a great hole. And they're, um, you know, I think it's, they're, they're great bunkers because of that. And, you know, having my history with, you know, being a young kid and, you know, you know, flirting with them, being able to like, not worried about them too much. And now like, you know, I'm 58. And so it's, I'm getting to the point where they're an issue for me, you know, still coming back. You know, I'm I'm back. Yeah. I'm back. I'm on the back tee and my ball flight isn't like super high. It's low. I grew up in the wind there. So uh, I still play a low ball. And if I, you know, if I don't quite carry it, you know, they, they can be an issue. And so um, that's a fun aspect that the sort of playing history of, of having to deal with them. But then also working around them, you know, I was always, I was maintaining around them. I was, you know, I was edging, I was breaking the, breaking the bunkers. I was, um, you know, cleaning up the grass around them or the weeds and things like that. And um, throwback, this is, so this is probably 1979 or 80. And I'm, um, and we're working and we're cleaning the weeds out of the bunker. Was, we didn't have a lot of maintenance, you know, back then. And here comes a group of guys and they're playing and general Greenfield, he hits it into the bunkers 
And this guy was a great guy. And I knew him because I worked in the, in the bag room and stuff. And he and his wife were just fantastic, wonderful people. And he was a general in the air force and really was the a general. general. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Not, not, as, <laughs> Super not good. something you call them in the bag room. Right. People call no, them. He, he was, actually called, well. he was yeah. a general. Yeah. So <laughs> super great guy. And so he's, he's in the middle of the scabs and we're, we all stop working, you know, so he can hit his shot and he, and he's down there with this wedge in his hand and these guys that he's playing with are over there and he, they can't see him. And he just yells out, they've got me surrounded. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, we're these, we're these worker kids, you know, and we're just, we're just laughing because he had such a great attitude. And here's a, here's a, military guy they got me surrounded yeah. <laughs> we're, yeah, right. we're just like oh how perfect is this you know he got it out too so it was good <laughs> awesome well no wonder you love they're your, they're your yeah. favorite bunkers you've got Absolutely. a you've got a long history with them and they are um looking at them in these images very stunning to look at so everyone check them out in golfer's journal 22 uh mike i can't thank you enough for for the time you've given us i just want to ask you before we go, um, when it comes to golf course architecture and we look at the bigger picture, um, where do you see things going? Are there any right now, the trends in short courses and even people are taking on more reversible courses and, um, more courses based on templates. You know, we've got basically two Lido courses opening up, um, uh, and, and by Doke and, um, and, and Gil, did you, were, did your time with Gil overlap at all? Or were you off on your own? Yeah, plan? Gil. Um, well, he actually, Gil worked a summer uh, at High Point, like early on, like with a, okay. when they were just first building it. He came, he was, he was in grad school at that time. He was working on his master's at uh, Cornell. And um, so he, I didn't meet, I didn't meet him until later. But anyway, um, he wasn't, he was gone uh, when I, when I worked for Tom and then uh, when we were building the Black Forest up in Michigan, um, Gil um, was hired and came on um, and shaped really, you know, a lot of the bunkers there and stuff like that. And Tom worked on the greens and things like that. So, so Gil actually, I'm trying to, he actually came on at the very end of um, uh, the Legends Complex down in Myrtle Beach. And then uh, he didn't come up to he didn't come up to Michigan for maybe the first six months because um, they had they had their daughter Chelsea and so they stayed there where they where they were you know down in Myrtle Beach and then and then they moved up and then he built all the you know most of the bunkers and Tom did most of the greens and um, and I was I was running around running the running the crew and stuff and getting things built so. Yeah, so Gil and I we go we go way back also. Yeah. Yeah, because for people that don't know, Gil Hans um also came up under uh Tom Doak. Uh you can listen to type listen, learn more about that on our podcast with Tom Doak uh, on the Golfers Journal. Um and I think earlier in the pod I probably called him Gil Hans because I still do that. Um <laughs> as much as he lives about three minutes from my house and <laughs> I do get to see him quite a quite a bit when he's not uh, well, usually on the road, but nonetheless, uh, Gil Hans, um, uh, do you, do you consult with him? Do you cross paths? Do you hang out? Like, are, are, is that someone, um, that you keep in touch with? Yeah, no, we keep in touch. Um, but you know, we're both busy, you know, same thing. Yeah. Um, you are busy. Yeah, it's, it's a fun, you know, Tom, we live in the same town, but, um, you know, I run into him, you know, in the, you know, pro shop at crystal downs or in the airport and stuff we're coming back and we kind of catch up like that i mean it's a weird it's kind of bizarre um you know because we're always going in different directions but um are you ever uh, like member member partners that would be <laughs> i would like to caddy for you if you were that would be kick ass, no man. no 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 he wanted us to do this this shot no this shot <laughs> <laughs> dude we played and he's got he's wicked with that um with that Wilson putter, like he, that, that old school putter. He's, yeah. he's, he's yeah. pretty, he's pretty lethal with that thing. I was, <laughs> I was impressed. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so, no, we have not been member, member partners. No, 
But right. uh, that would be that, that would be fun. We actually. could do that for charity, and then good. we'll auction off who gets the caddy for you, and it would be a whole we'll dis- awesome thing. We'll discuss what Alistair was trying to do. No, Maxwell screwed it up here. He should have done this. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just think of all the banter oh it'd be great <laughs> it would be awesome um speaking of banter if we look ahead uh i guess my original question was just saying, yeah in 10 years 15 years any idea what the uh i guess that's the if you if you knew you'd be a yeah i think well i billionaire, but what's um, the looking think, ahead with any trends i think all of these um all of these new trends or what's the new trend or this or that all these things have been around. I mean, they were building the reversible golf courses a long time ago, right? And yep, it's nice to see that opportunity um, present itself in that it maybe it's more mainstream. So when there is a good opportunity to do that, someone goes, oh, that'll never sell, you know, because a lot of times you, you know, you might run into a client that they're pretty conservative. They're like, oh, you know, no one will want to do that. That doesn't make any sense. But I think, you know, maybe seeing a bit more of that, that's helpful. Um, I do think that short courses do have a, they, they have an opportunity to do certain things and, and uh, whether that's an adjunct to um, a public or a private facility, I think that's a good way to augment um, activity, practice, making it fun for all levels, not just like this is the kids course, which is a lot of ways how some mm. of the things you know think like you think about port rush you know they have the championship course and then they have the valley course and it's like you know that's sort of like that's the second course you know there's a lot of really good golf on that on that golf course for sure so um so i think you know i think the thing is you just got to build quality um you got to engage the golfer right get back to that you know it's about being engage about having it be fun and some of those things you know having short courses and things uh, Himalayas putting greens and stuff like that, that you can really raise the fun factor bar on that. Like, Hey, we're not, we're not worried about posting a score. Mm -hmm. If we can, if the Americans can get out of their way and just enjoy it, then, you know, that, that, that's really what it's about. Kind of, that's what it's about when you're, that's what it's about when you're a kid and you're going out with your mate and having, you know, Oh, got you on that one. Okay, cool. And then, you know, flips around the next, the next hole or whatever. And you, you know, it's, those are the things you talk about, right? No doubt about it. You've been down under talking about your mates. <laughs> um, you've been down under for a while now. Uh, Mike, thank you so much. Last question. When I have an architect on, love to ask them just simply in your estimation, what makes a golf course great? That's kind of a, well, that's a, it's a great question being great. And the interesting thing is, is, you know, having grown up at Crystal Downs and working on the golf course every day of the summer, you know, it's top 20 in the world or whatever it is and whatever list. Um, that's great. Right. So Mm -hmm. for me, it's a really, really high bar, but, um, I think what, what makes a not just a great golf course, but I think what makes it um, for a really great golfing experience is, is, is that golf course significant in far as how it complements its environment, its place? Does it, is it, is it have stuff that's unique that is, uh, that draws things out? We, we're not a tennis court. We're not X by X flat with a three foot net and, you know, everyone's the same. The surface might be different, clay or hard court, but every tennis court's the same. That's not what golf is. Golf has this opportunity to draw what's unique about a site. So um, great, like for it to be a great golf course, it might not be the top level, it might not be the top 20 or the top 100 in the world or whatever list you're looking at, but it might still be a really great place and super fun and all that. And can we, can we do that? Um, that's sort of one of the things that's kind of weird about, you know, building a template course one after another, is it, are you doing a really good job of that? Or are you just sort of pushing in the formula, you know, to be critical of that, 
in a, you know, in, in an argumentative way, but that, you know, there's, there's a lot of great tough courses out there too. So, yeah. you know, you look at Rainer and McDonald's body of work, it's pretty good. Um, it's not bad. But I think, um, you know, you need to have unique golf courses. You need to respond to your site. I think you need to, you need to find out what is inherent in that. And that, I guess that's what, that's what I'm trying to do because if we could, you know, we have technology now we can, we can build this, build that. You can LIDAR something and throw a bulldozer down and they'll build that exactly. I mean, they did that with Alito. It's an interesting technology and stuff. I'd like to learn more about that when you're trying to preserve something too. Like, can you get that stuff and, and get back to it um, in case some disaster happens, right? Um, yeah. So that's an interesting aspect of things. Um, but for me, the fun of doing what we get to do, which I'm very fortunate, you know, to love what I do is trying to find that what's a little something special about this one. It might mimic or be similar to, you know, a hole or remind you of a hole, but what is, what's unique and special about it in this, in this part of the property or something. And that's, that's really what makes what we do fun. Awesome. Oh, I lied. I do have one more question. If you have to take <laughs> Crystal Crystal Downs out of it and any of your courses out of it, what are your top five? Oh, fun question because I have this you joke with me. I have this joke with. Uh, in fact, he called me yesterday. Um, and he's a, one of the supers I work with out in the New York Met area, and this was like 15 years ago, and we had just gone out and played the played the national. And he goes, "Give me your top five. What are your top five? <laughs> right. Right. You and it was this was so long ago I, I actually hadn't been to Australia yet. And so I only gave him four because I figured maybe Royal Melbourne was gonna like, you know, creep into the deal. And so I you know I, I never actually completed the question, the answer to him. But he calls me, he goes, Hey, it's top five. Give me a call back. Because <laughs> that's what I call him now. Uh so top five calling. Yeah. Yeah, they're uh well you got to go with the old course, um, mm-hmm. right off the bat. Really amazing. Um, national golf links. Um, I think I would put Melbourne in there. Uh, probably Cypress point and. Oh, it's, it's so hard to pick, you know, one, uh, one here or there. So I would, I would, um, I think I'd probably have to say Dornick. A good um, list. And then, and then I'll, I'll give you an adjunct there too. I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll give you the sort of the dark, I have two dark horses that I always, when people ask these types of things that I talk about, um, and one is Belvedere, which you mentioned earlier that you played, which is a really wonderful William Watson knock, design. Knock my socks off. It's, Straight. I mean, I left sockless. That place was so good. It's so much fun. It has just this great atmosphere. The little pro shop. Oh, my gosh. Tiny yeah. little clubhouse. You know, it's just a really fun. I've, I've never sent anybody there that, that said, oh, that was really disappointing. You know, it wasn't. They're like, oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> so fun. And it's, it's great to play hickories there, too. It's really fun to play hickories. Um, and then the other one would be the Lynx course at Lawsonia, which is yeah. a William Langford design, Guido Moreau's partner. Um, and just, you know, they did a lot of earth moving like Rainer and McDonald did and banks, but they did it on farmland in the Midwest predominantly. And so they're, they're artificial landforms, but they're these, they're these really big, cool, um, you know, bold statements, large greens and things like that. And, um, the Marquette golf club up in the UP where I did gray walls, their original golf course was designed by Langford and Moreau and they, they designed 18, but they only built nine. The original nine holes were starting to restore that and get the greens out to those. And there's a, there's a green there, the six, that was only a third of the size of what the original green was. You know, when I first saw it, <laughs> it's oh, wow. just ridiculous how, you know, small everything had shrunk. And those greens are, those complexes are on 
you know, the same level as Lawsonia Lynx is, which is, you know, predominantly considered their, their greatest work or whatever. But um, I knew a lot about the golf course and hadn't, hadn't actually physically been there and went down with the pro there from Marquette. Cause I said, you've got to see this cause you need to understand how good, you know, the original nine holes could be, uh, which would, had been expanded to 18, but the original nine holes in the complexes and he, and Mark is, Mark was the assistant pro at Crystal Downs when, when I was the kid in the bag room. So I, we've known each other for a long, you know, almost my life. And, um, so we went down to Lawsonia and we were going around in the third hole, which has, you know, the dairy barn. So the old historic dairy barns next to them and stuff. And I was just so excited about everything. And I've hit my drive in the middle of the fairway and I'm addressing the ball and, and my heart feels like it's about to explode and jump out of my chest. I had, I couldn't pull the club back. I, I had to step away from the ball and Mark's like, what's wrong? I like, I, I can't, I can't swing. I'm like, this is so cool. This is like, this is so, so amazing. Like I these... thought you were going to tell me you had a heart attack. <laughs> well, I, I may have. I, I was like, well, this story it felt like it. it felt like it was just yeah. like, I couldn't, I couldn't physically pull the club back. And it happened again on the fourth tee, you know, and I was just yeah. like, Mark, this is so cool. You, you know, uh, yeah, this is just unbelievable. I've never had oh, that. I, yeah. I've never had that experience anyplace else. That's pretty, that's pretty high praise for some place. That is a testament. No doubt. And no, tri- I mean, Lasonia links, um, I sing its praises pretty, pretty loudly in a course called America. It was one of my favorite it was sort of a fine because you know i'm going to wisconsin to play uh you know sand valley and aaron hills etc and um i was like oh i'll check out this lasonia place um because some people have talked about it and it is it really is so good um yeah one of the greens didn't they bury like a box car under it or a bus or something legend Um, has it yeah (laughs) Yeah, under seven yeah they were big land movers yeah um you know which at the time like not easy not easy to do um that's awesome. Uh, you didn't mention, I'm talking to a Philly guy. I was, I thought you might throw me a bone. Um, see, Gil is very good about that living out here now. When I talk, <laughs> whenever I top five Gil, we get a little rolling green. We get a little Marion. Um, that's all right. Well, uh, it's, you're, in, uh, you're in the Midwest. Well, you could, I mean, you could, you could just pick top five and you could do it in Philly itself. I know. Yeah. And, right. Um, good. yeah. You know, so, Mary, no, but that, Pine, that, Pine Valley, that dog track, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wait a second. I want to get back. I want to get invited back. Um, no, awesome. Oh, it, all right. I, guess I swear this is my last question. Why the orange tees? Since you worked at Crystal Downs, um, is there a story behind the orange tees? If you ever go to play at Crystal yeah. Downs, the tees that, you know, in the tee, in the box that they give you, they are bright neon orange. And, uh, which have seemed to have no connection to the golf course at all. But my member, the member, you know, that I members I've been with are just, that they're always, they've always been orange. Did Fred, did, did the pro just like them? Well, so this goes back, you know, almost 45 years and Fred owned the shop. The club didn't own the shop or anything. The pro shop, you know, he had a contract with the club and he owned the shop, all the merchandise. And he, he, he buys the tees and, you know, whatever. So, you know, they buy a gross of teas, which is a, you know, a big box of teas and you think you could never run out of teas. Right. Well, yeah. he gets these teas this one year and they're like, there's too thin, you know, they break constantly. Guys just grab handfuls, you know, they, and they're just indiscriminate with the teas. Right. Right. So he finds a manufacturer that makes a stout tea. That's, I mean, it's twice as thick as like your super pencil thin job. Uh Um, not twice as thick, but I mean, close with one and a half times thicker, probably it's a stout, it's a wooden tea still. Right. And it's, it's high vis orange. It's, it's flame orange, fluorescent orange. He goes, we're not going to run out of teas this year. Cause like guys, like I can't find it. You know, I I lost the tea. I broke the tea. It's like, you need one tea here, dude. You're never going to lose this. (laughs) 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 And so that just became the, uh, that just became the standard. And so, you know, for years, the first ones, in fact, I grabbed an old bag of mine that was in the garage for some, I don't know what the deal. And I, and there was one of the old original fluorescent ones in there. Yeah. That was like super high vis, 
And, uh, and <laughs> it's like, cause the ones now are like, they're a little muted orange. They're not, they're not actually like high fizz. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the story. That's, I'm so glad there's a story to it. Cause I've always, <laughs> cause I was wondering about that. And, um, and it's one of those, like, if you know, you know, things, if you see someone teeing up an orange tea, you know, then you got, it's like a nod, you know, it's like, yeah, man, uh, I know you know where you've crystal been. Down. I know where you've been. It doesn't say crystal downs on it. Nope. You know, there's no, but you've got the orange tea. It's a little secret handshake. Yeah. That is, that is kind of cool. Um, oh, that's, that's fantastic. And what a great note to end on because of course here at the golfer's journal, we are the broken tea society. Um, so an appropriate, uh, an appropriate final question, which it actually was, um, Mike, I can't thank you enough for your time. I'm glad we were able to make it work. We're on very different schedules here with you down in uh, in Tasmania. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad that it worked out. Uh, wishing you all the best. Uh, wishing your family and your crew. Um, is your wife with you? Are you? Yeah, uh, she is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yep. All right. Well, yep. enjoy your time down there. And uh, and hopefully you get to listen to the game. And, uh, and I can't, as a Notre Dame guy, I'm not going to. I'm not going to wish you well, um, but uh, it's a, it's an entertaining game. I it's a that. it's always a good battle with the Domers. There you go. Yeah, Mike, be well, and love to have you back on sometime. This was so much fun. Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate it.